What is violence? It's a question I find myself confronted with on a regular basis in my line of work. So much of what is labelled violence isn't. Yet perhaps more worrying, so much of what isn't labelled violence is. So how do we go about sorting what is and what isn't violence? Well, the first thing to note is this. Not all violence is physical. This is the hurdle many people have the hardest time overcoming because so much of the discourse surrounding violence focuses on this one form. Yet the very language in how you refer to it as physical violence, using physical as an adjective, would suggest that there are more forms violence can take. Now one place to start figuring this out might be a dictionary. Indeed, Lexico, the online version of the Oxford Dictionary, offers us three definitions of violence, one primary and two secondary. The first one being, quote, behavior involving physical force intended to hurt, damage, or kill someone or something, end quote. Then we have, quote, strength of emotion or an unpleasant or destructive natural force, end quote. Lastly, we have a definition relating to law, which states, quote, the unlawful exercise of physical force or intimidation by the exhibition of such force, end quote. So in the last definition, we do see an additional form of violence, intimidation, what we could perhaps consider a form of psychological violence. When a threat is made, it can result in a series of psychological reactions, creating a sense of mental anguish, such as fear, frustration, or hopelessness. Things that can result in extensive psychological conditions such as post-traumatic stress disorder, intermittent explosive disorder, or depression, resulting in clear harm. However, is a dictionary definition good enough? It's true that the last definition is a rudimentary legal definition in the UK, but is that definition, along with the others, internationally recognised? If not, where else might we source a more universal definition of the term? Well, we could turn to the work of groups like the World Health Organization, a specialist branch of the United Nations tasked with tending to international public health. A big part of what they do is tackling violence, and to do so, one must first define it. As such, the World Health Organization has a detailed definition of violence, which is, quote, the intentional use of physical force or power, threatened or actual, against oneself, another person, or against a group or community, that either results in or has a high likelihood of resulting in injury, death, psychological harm, maldevelopment, or deprivation. End quote. Now one thing I should be clear on is the fact that the word intentional solely applies to the act, not the outcome. So for example... A parent may vigorously shake a crying infant with the intent to quieten it, causing brain damage in the process. Force was clearly used, but injury was not intended. And yet, this would still constitute violence under the WHO's definition, since a person may intentionally commit an act that, by objective standards, is judged to be dangerous and have a high likelihood of resulting in adverse health effects, even if the individual does not recognize it as such. In contrast, a car accident and the resulting harm from that would not be considered violent since whilst the act of driving is intentional, it was the crash, an unintentional accident, that resulted in harm. Driving itself does not carry with it a likely chance of causing adverse health effects, unlike crashing, excluding it from being violence. This is an important concept to keep in mind since many people argue something cannot be violent unless the culprit intended the specific harm that resulted from their actions, when that is not true in the slightest. If there was probable reason to expect harm on an objective level, their actions were still violent, no matter their personal ignorance or ideological framework. Now one thing the WHO is clear on is the inclusion of power, relating to the different sorts of power relationships at play in society. Violence can also include neglect or acts of omission, withholding something from a person or group of people that results in or has a high likelihood of resulting in harm. So with those points made clear, 
we might start to consider the types of power that exist and how they can manifest as violence. So I tried to come up with a list of different types of power, nothing exhaustive and there's crossover among some of these. For example, almost all forms of violence carry the potential to double as psychological violence. However, I wanted a list that included a few that are often recognised, if not thought of immediately, when we say violence. Along the sun that we don't typically consider as having potential to be violent. So I came up with a few of my own before taking to Twitter to ask for more, and here are the ones I ended up with. Physical, psychological, economic, informational, social, political, and sexual. Now I won't discuss physical and psychological since nobody doubts physical, and I've already discussed the way psychological violence can manifest itself. However, I'd like to take a few minutes to go through the other items on the list, discussing how violence in relation to said power manifests itself. Starting with economic or capital-based violence. Let's say we have this couple, Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Now, Mr. Smith is a bit different. He's a stay-at-home father, looking after three children whilst his wife, Mrs. Smith, goes off to work. Over time, however, Mrs. Smith starts doing something. She starts withholding access to the family finances from Mr. Smith, not allowing him to purchase anything, not even necessities like food, bathroom supplies, and cleaning products, without her permission. Eventually, this grows to the point that Mrs. Smith is limiting who Mrs. Smith can go and see, effectively severing their connection to family and friends. If Mrs. Smith ever raises an issue with the way that Mrs. Smith's treatment is depriving not just him of his basic needs, but the rest of the family, Mrs. Smith threatens him with even more severe financial restrictions. That would be a form of economic violence in an abusive household, something that is legally recognised in certain places. Another form of economic violence that's not typically legally recognised, but has entered discourse rather strongly recently, is wage slavery. This idea that if you're unable to work, then you deserve to lack access to things included in your fundamental human rights, such as food, shelter and water, even if there's a surplus of these things. This is something even more prevalent in countries which lack nationalised healthcare, something that's come to the forefront in American discourse due to workers being forced to risk exposing themselves to the COVID-19 virus, otherwise they'll be fired and lose their health coverage, which is tied up to their job. This is a form of economic violence targeted at the working class, and it's often used to try and break up unions or stop other forms of protest. Moving forward, we have informational violence, what we might also refer to as knowledge-based violence or educational violence. Perhaps the best contemporary example of this is highlighted by the work of Malala Yousafzai, a Pakistani woman who as a young girl fought for the right to education. Age 15, she became the target of attempted assassination by the Taliban, trying to put an end to her activism. But even before the attempt on her life, she was a victim of informational violence. How? Well, education is another human right, one which gives the individual the knowledge to use resources that allow for their independence. Education is a universal emancipator. One thing we find time and time again is that increasing access to education in an area, particularly for women, increases the well-being of not just the individual, but their family and entire community. This is especially true when it comes to educational matters of gender and relationship education. Teaching young people about reproductive health gives them the ability to plan a family on their terms, whilst also reducing risk-taking behaviour. Teaching them about identities outside of cisgender and heteronormative standards lets them know that there is nothing wrong with them in being queer, something households typically fail to do, which results in the harm of the individual. Much in the same way that groups such as the Black Panthers used school programs to ensure children had proper meals, they can and should be used to ensure that queer people receive the support they often lack at home. Denying anybody said education, whilst an act of admittance, is neglect and therefore constitutes as a form of violence. Coming round to social violence, what we might also refer to as ideological violence, this can cover a wide range of actions from adult and child physical aggression, like corporal punishment in schools, to segregation, 
These acts are committed as part of a community, ones which impact the social well-being of the victim. For example, corporal punishment, whilst also being physical violence and harming the individual that way, teaches children that violence is the proper resolution for matters that could be resolved using explanation, continuing the cycle of violence across generations and even cultures. It impacts the individual's perception of social interaction in a harmful way, increasing levels of aggression when faced with relatively mundane situations. Moving on to segregation, the impact this has on a person's well-being and self-value is astonishing. Treatment of entire groups as second-class citizens can, over time, ingrain itself and become internalized, something I've seen with the caste system here in India. It becomes self-policing at that point, because segregation, whilst it can, doesn't need to be legislated. Community pressure can be enough to enforce it, making certain people feel unwelcome in certain circles or unable to use services, in effect making it more difficult or even impossible for them to function as a part of society. Which is part of the reason I consider it separate to political violence, what may also be known as legislative violence, violence carried out by a governing body. Because even when a community fully supports a group of people, legislators can go against that and enforce their own form of violence. For example, 71% of Americans support transgender people being allowed to serve in the military, and yet the trans military ban put in place under Donald Trump remains in effect. Another common form of political violence revolves around abortion access, with cis men dictating the bodies of cis women, trans men, intersex, and MB folk. We also saw calls for this recently in the secular community surrounding demands by certain people for numerous human and civil rights to be stripped from trans folk, demands that would not only go on to hurt them, but intersex and cisgender people as well. To put succinctly, any call to strip a demographic of their human and or civil rights is a call to legislative violence regardless of your intended outcome. Lastly, we come to sexual violence, which I'll try to be considerate with as possible. Thing is, I had a hard time quantifying sexual violence outside of other forms of violence. For example, surely rape causes physical harm, stalking a form of social or psychological violence, and landlord extortion or sex trafficking a form of economic violence. So I went back to the WHO's definition of violence and try to come up with a concept of sexual power. What I came to is one's control over their sexual autonomy. Therefore, sexual violence would be the violation of that. And it's then I realized how I'd messed up in my original thoughts. Rape isn't always physically violent in that it doesn't always leave signs of physical harm. When I was raped as a child, my abuser didn't need to physically restrain me as a convinced me to participate under the pretense of playing a game. Yet that violation of sexual autonomy, bypassing consent I could not give, that was sexual violence. In my initial thoughts, I'd hastily generalize the way rape takes place, falling back on how media typically presents it. So I hope this quick rundown has given you a greater appreciation of violence and the forms it can take beyond physical and a lesser known but still sometimes discussed psychological form. Now again, this is not an official typography or model for the forms of violence, though there are some out there. For example, we have the typology of interpersonal violence used by the WHO, which, whilst a good model, isn't really that helpful in day-to-day discussion. Models in general are also restrictive compared to a basic definition, requiring you to memorize different categories and subcategories rather than remember a few basic features of violence. By this, I'm referring to the way that, so long as you remember that violence is the application of physical force or power that has a higher likelihood of harming an individual or group of people, if the action itself is intentional, regardless of whether the outcome is, you can work out whether something is violent or not from there, thus making the definition much more useful than a set model. Even the WHO discusses different ways to differentiate between the types of violence. For example, in how they recognize economic, social, and political violence, 
but use the umbrella of collective violence for them. This video is more about equipping you with some basic understanding, opening up avenues of discussion, rather than offering a strict framework. So hopefully I've achieved my goal in that regard. Yet before I go, I'd just like to note a few points, starting with a potential criticism of the WHO's definition of violence, namely the idea that its definition is too broad. Now in response to this, I have to wonder, why is one form of intentional harm worse than any other? Because that's what you're forwarding when you make this argument. You are at the very least insinuating that other forms of harm shouldn't be considered because they are lesser. It can't be because there's a need to differentiate between types of harm, because I've already demonstrated that doing such is possible through the simple act of adding a qualifying adjective. So the only reason I can see a person genuinely arguing that case is if they, or someone they like, engages in such violence. Avoiding physical violence whilst engaging in other forms as a method of ensuring plausible deniability in the public eye, something the WHO's definition strips them of. It means they have to justify their actions in committing or calling for political, economic, informational, or psychological violence. It puts them on defense, something they never want to be since their entire position relies on avoiding scrutiny and putting the pressure on you. And that's not a game I intend to play. Which leads me on to another point, and that is violence can be justified. There are a number of situations in which violence can become alright. Whilst the case people typically think of is self-defense, there are other instances. For example, anti-colonial resistance. Bhagat Singh was an Indian revolutionary who participated in both the assassination of a British police officer and a series of bomb attacks on the Central Legislative Assembly here in Delhi. Those actions were entirely justified in the context of British colonialism. Yet even in day to day, we've come to accept some forms of violence as acceptable. For example, the violence required for policing. An arrest is not a neutral act, it is a violent one, which is why police are expected to meet a certain level of reasonable suspicion prior to doing so. Sadly, in our current system, this has been abused to high hell, drawing into question whether the police force can be saved or if it would be better to demolish the entire system and start again, especially when we consider the existence of canteen culture. The point is, whilst violence is not inherently bad, the level one has to go to in order to demonstrate that violence is justified is pretty high, usually relating to greater harm against innocent parties, at which point violence can even become a duty. So when a Nazi goose steps his way into public, advocating for genocide, taking a swing and reminding him what we do to Nazis, that isn't just okay, that's imperative. Now if you appreciate what myself and Adita do here on the channel in fighting back against misinformation, do know that you can support us via Patreon. Your support gives us the funds to keep going and keep putting out videos involving this level of research. You can also check out our other videos to see more of what we have to offer. So with that said, we'd just like to thank our Patreon sponsors, giving a special thanks to the following people. Hannah Banghart, Matthew Kovac, Soraya and Katie, Garrett Van Vors, Chelsea Williams, Doyle Jackson, Wellington Marcus, Sosh Daniels, Justin Allen, and Atlas 5. And for myself and Adita, take care now.